Um, uh, the last sermon series that we've gone through, we called it Go. We snagged it from Brian Houston, a hill song. And what uh, we would all like you guys to start doing is when we give sermons, watch videos, even if it's a forum, um, start thinking, if you haven't already, like my dad said this morning, so what, question mark. What does that mean for me? And the next question, what does that mean for my church? Uh, that's a big, significant thing, because we're all a part of the church, and so we've got to get it right with us first before it can manifest itself in the congregation. And so today we're going to go over the last uh, four or five sermons and discuss stuff. If anybody has any questions, they can ask questions. Uh, you can answer the questions. Miss Diane is going to walk around with the microphone. It's in your seat. And she'll put it in your face so you can be heard and recorded so everybody can share in our understanding and knowledge. And the first thing I guess I could ask you guys is... When we understand that we're on mission with God, what do you guys, or what have you guys come to understand with the last series of sermons on how to make the gap disappear? The, the life that we live every day and the unlived life within us, being on mission with God, how, what does it look like when that gap is huge and, and there and how do we bring it together? Rick. For me, when I look at what you just said, personally, I must succumb to the calling of Christ through commission with God. I have to succumb to it. Now, when we think of succumb, we generally think of ceasing to be alive. Well, part of my mindset and part of my living has to succumb. And then it is being intentionally connected to the co-mission of God and the mission of Christ, which he draws us into. So it's extremely intentional in knowing where I belong mentally and what I belong doing physically. Anybody else? Dave. In short, knowing what God wants you to do and doing it. Yeah, uh, yeah, Diane. For me, it's running towards God, not away. Oh, so you're being a lamb, not a goat. Oh, yes, I don't want to be a goat. Goats are stubborn, and, and so we're being lambs. Isn't that funny, Deborah? We talked about that in <laughs> Bible study. Yes. Where Jesus separates the lambs and yes, the goats. Yes, that's why I said it. All those months ago, we talked about, do you want to be a lamb or a goat? Um, if you guys are willing to share, you don't have to, of course. Um, how did I word it? Let me read my question. Has anybody come to a new and different understanding than they had previously to how they can apply what we talked about in all the sermons in their own life? How can they make that gap shrink or push the resistance aside, or as Curtis talked about, having that trust in God, and you getting on your knees and lifting your hands up, that's succumbing to me. I'm in a weak position, and I know God's going to lift me up, and he's going to make me whole, and I'm going to be able to do what he asks. So anybody have any thoughts or things they're willing to share on, like, well, I heard this, and it made me want to change this? Mr. Miller. I had to come to grips with the fact that my main life, my physical living, my everyday life was secondary to my spiritual life, which I was really to make the focus of my everyday living. Uh, we think of getting up, going to work, babysitting the grandkids, whatever. We think of that as our primary function each day. And for me, it was getting rid of that notion and actually getting up and being in the mindset of my vocation of Christ being first and primary. Anybody else? 
Curtis. I also think it's necessary to accept that there's a dual relationship that I have to have with God, and the dual is the spiritual and the natural, and be willing to embrace the spiritual just as much as the natural, because it's through the spirit that God is really getting my attention and talking to me more than in the natural. Mm -hmm. I find that the more people I talk to, the more I go to school and learn, the more I r listen and, and heed God's call, the more I understand that we as just an individual, nobody else in taking in, you know, them into consideration, just me as an individual, I have to embrace the ugly broken part of me. No different than I would embrace that same type of a person outside of me so that I can overcome that person, so that I can change, so that I can grow and do different. And I use myself as an example, but that's something that everybody has to go through when it comes to changing their life and walking with God and being on mission with him because he asks us to do some of what seems like the craziest things, things that are so far out of what we thought we were capable of doing. But when we do it, we don't just survive. We thrive in the midst of the commission that God calls us to be on. James. I've been noticing that I've talked to God a lot more lately. I've been on 36-foot ladders and 40-foot ladders with crumbly soil on the bottom yeah. part. And somebody holding the ladder, but I've been noticing I've been talking to God a lot more lately. And he does give me my skills. It don't just come from the air or whatever you, God you did install reason. that yeah. absolutely Yeah, to make people think man there is no glass there like I did two weeks ago yes we drove past the freeway the other day mm -hmm. and I saw the fruits of their efforts and you can really yeah. tell the difference so the Rainier Brewery is the bright yellow part. The yellow the part, part is bright building. and shiny, and the windows are clean. You betcha. Wow. Pretty impressive. You are a brave man, and I'm glad it's you and not me. <laughs> and if God calls me to do that, I guess I'll go do that too, but not right now. <laughs> Anybody else? Miss Barry. Through our studies um, the past few weeks, um, I have um, found that I am being drawn more into wanting to learn more and to spend more time reading to find out um, about um, my spiritual self and um, learn more about God and what his word is. And um, I'm also drawn to, to try and be in him through the whole day. And when I spend time in my devotions in the morning and just plug in periodically throughout the day, it's, I'm finding it a lot easier. Oh, wow. See, that's awesome. That's wonderful. Yes, Miss Diane. That's how it is for me. James was talking about he talks to God all the time. That's what was just happening to me. And through the Bible studies that we've been doing, God's just been doing a work in me to where God is, I feel God's presence with me always. And I don't really know the difference anymore between work and church and all that. To me, it's all in God it's one life and it's in him and he's always with me and I just appreciate that and I think about that when I talk to people saying the right things doing the right things and that's just always with me and that's really exciting to want God that much because that's new for me to want God more than anything else so I had somebody and you you just spoke to something and and Rick said something when he gave his first uh, idea when he talked. I had somebody describe to me that our life should be lived according to joy. Jesus, others, and then yourself. But is that really the truth? No, I think our pride gets in the way. It's not the truth. There isn't supposed to be an order 
because God is in everything. And when you function knowing that, then it's just what you say. You don't know the difference anymore of I have you, I didn't have you. You, you just, he's got you. And you know it, you live it, you breathe it. And it's that, like I said when I was speaking, putting on the armor, you walk in the armor always, but you only pick up the sword when you have to. And it's that whole preach the gospel and use words only when necessary type thing. I totally agree with you. Yeah. You said in capital H. Yes. Him. Live him. Capital H. Yes. Yes, capital H. I had to do the capital thing when I was speaking because it's just, it's so important to know that we're talking about God. You know, and we're the ones that believe. We're the ones that can cast out demons. We're the ones that can speak truth and, and power and success into the people's lives when they feel that if they take one more breath, they will die. Or that they already are dying. Or they're hopeless. And when you understand that and you live it and you know that when you open up your mouth, I, I kind of look at it like, like a Walt Disney movie you can walk and leave a desert and desolation behind you, or you can do what Curtis always tells me, when a believer, wherever they go, when they walk, it's like the seeds by the millions are in their, the dust of where they just tread, and they're sprouting, and there's growth, and it's green, and it's the tree of life. That's just how I view it. And that's a powerful thing we have in us. And so many of us don't get that. And so we, we think that when we're weak that we just, we suck. You know, we're not good enough. We got to just remember we're that greenery, we're that beauty, even though we feel like we're not. Rick. Part of our lives, the physical daily part of it, is the valley that we walk through. We don't put our stone foundation for our house there. We go through the valley to the mountain on the other side. But in doing that, the valley still has value. It's what we go through. It's what we bring with us to give to others in the valley that counts. And in that, we have to remember, we are the image bearers of Christ for many people who see us and meet us. We're also the only kind of Jesus they're going to meet in a given day. And so for us, not only do we take the bushel basket off of our light at the top of the hill, but we convey all these things and we're instructed, don't live in the middle of the valley, don't build your house there, Go on through to the other side, and I've got you while you are in the valley, says God. Well, what's amazing to me, too, is that we can have people we know or even strangers who find themselves in the midst of the valley, and they were born into a culture and a family and an understanding that the valley was where they lived, and they must toil every day for the fruits of their labor. Granted, we know we toil every day for the fruits of our labor, but there's a difference when God's in us. There's a joy, and like I said, when I was speaking, the sacrifice you give when you're on mission with God is nothing compared to the reward of knowing that you are touching people and you're, you're even touching yourself, changing yourself, uh, taking people on your mission that you're on and, and showing them firsthand what Jesus has done for you. And that that experience, they see why you're so different. You know, like I said, how in the world can you be so calm in the midst of the chaos that is reigning around you in the life you have to live with all of the stuff? It's Jesus in me. I can't say anything except it's God in me. This morning, I think it was, or yesterday, um, our, de, our head denomination, Grace Community International, posted something on their um, church multiplication ministry website. This is an actual blog that they run. 
Um, it is called the Surprising God Blog, one word, .gci.org. And they were talking about uh, a gentleman, Mr. Ray S. Anderson. He's a Trinitarian theolo a theologian. And they were discussing his book, The Shape of Practical Theology. And I read it to my dad this morning. He says, why don't you read that during services? Because it gets to the heart of what we learned in the sermon series coming to fruition in the body of believers, the church of God. We hear a lot these days about the need for churches to become missional. Various models and strategies are offered, including the one in the diagram below. And if you want to see the diagram, go to that link I told you. Ray Anderson offers a Christ-centered approach shaped by incarnational Trinitarian theology. And this is what the gentleman says. The mission of the church is grounded in its nature as the community of the children of God whose lives are ontologically grounding in the very being of Jesus Christ. As the inner life of Jesus in his relation to the Father is con constitutive of Christology, so the inner life of the church in its experience of Jesus Christ is constitutive of ecclesiology. Those are a bunch of big words. But what, he, what it gets down to, the nuts and bolts of it is, just as the self-emptying, and if you will recall, my dad years ago gave a sermon on Easter, and he said the empty promises of Jesus, the empty tomb, the empty cross, get this, just as the self-emptying of the Son of God via the incarnation is the very basis for Jesus' ministry, so too the church is to be a community of self-emptying love. That's huge. That means you give of yourself, the, the God in you, the Christ in you, the same way he did on the cross. Rick. Come into this world full. Come into the world full. Go out of the world empty. As Jesus exists in a community of relation with the Father characterized by self-emptying, so does the church exist as a community of self-emptying in the world. It is the nature of the church that determines the form of the, its ministry. Jesus expresses this quite specifically in the prayer, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. John 17:18. The as and the so constitute the hinges on which the existence of God is as revealer and reconciler turns outward into the world. Ministry thus precedes and determines the existence of the church as the ministry and existence of Christ. So who are you? Christ, a believer is Christ. We are here doing his work. We are him. We live, capital H, him. Paul can thus appeal to the Christians to let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, Philippians 2, 5 through 7. That explains some of the, the things that we have felt in doing the work we do here at the church. I feel a satisfied sense of emptiness, but we perceive the word empty as almost always negative. This is not the empty we're talking about. You gave of yourself. Curtis. Yeah, again, I think again to remember that the process is that God is changing you. And it's a matter of you embracing the change and beginning to walk in the new way God is having you think and a new way of God's having you act. 
versus the way you used to act. And it's God mm -hmm. is doing it in you, and you're just now starting to yield to it. But because you still have your sinful nature, there's times when that is challenging mm -hmm. because you come to that road where you have to step off in faith in what you now know you can do versus wanting to do something that you used to do that you know you shouldn't do. Yeah, truly. Leanne, did you have your hand up? No? Okay. I saw something out of my corner of my eye. My next question, I guess, could be, was anybody unaware of the fact that they were already somewhat practicing this creating no more gap, the resistance part of life? Does anybody have a, a go-to solution that they found in their life when they realize they are about to partake in resistance or they find themselves in resistance? Is there something that you do to help yourself get out of that? Does anybody have any? Pray. Ask God for help. Pray and ask God He'll for help. He'll give it to you. He will give it. He, yes, he will. And I find just starting to read the word um, that uh, Jesus will start talking to me. And um, it's just very calming. And um, I feel I don't have to come up with the answers that that he does. I and, love that. Uh, I don't have to come up with the answers he does. Yeah, it's yes, so it's easy freeing. to live the day relaxed in him. Yes. But I think through all of our studies here that um, being told s this thing several different ways and different times has solidified it a little bit more. You know, I'm one who doesn't really um, take off on an idea and say that's mine. I have to hear it several places and um, practice it and you know then you come to a conclusion or you hear from God um, as to whether it's really for you know. Yeah. A lot of times I'll, I'll put music on because that can just minister to me or I can hear from God that way. And I think it's, you know, just because of his love, which is so encompassing and so awesome and the way he reveals himself to each of us and his grace, there's this passion that, that stirs that that when we feed that passion, there's a natural flow that happens in our lives, that the inside job and, and things happen on the outside from that, that transformation that happens. And it is, it's, it's really him. And, and it, to just constantly feed yourself that you would be zealous and be about the Father's business and aware of that and, and that's the waking in the morning and being aware of who, whose we are. And I was thinking too, you know, it, the lessons being about commission. But in the commission too, there's this submission that happens because he is leader, he is Lord, he's the commander in chief. Mm -hmm. And it's the reporting for duty. Yes. All the time. Here I am, send me. Rick. You know, we might find ourselves inclined to think of our, our congregation and our family here at New Hope as an embassy of a king, of a foreign country. And we have some of those responsibilities. We also might think of ourselves a little bit like an oracle of a king who's coming to put everything right. And our job is to share the right what that right is but really when it comes down to it it's really about honoring Jesus by being exactly like Jesus was and what he was was love and not one thing less and that is primary 
for me to stay on track and stay in the mental mode I want to be in all day, I have to live in the river, the same river that the man went out a thousand cubits and it was ankle deep. He went out a thousand more and it was knee deep. I have to intentionally choose to get in that river in the morning and live in that river all day until my eyes are closed and I'm no longer conscious. If I'm not in that river, I have problems. Well said. I have to say something about our congregation, and this was said to me yesterday by somebody. When the person said it to me, I cannot tell you the pride that I had in us as the little church that could. This person said to me, my whole life, I was raised to understand that baptism was something you did to show you agreed with the rules of the church that you went to and were willing to follow them. But when I come to you and your church, I find there are no rules. Why? And I said, because we're free. We're no longer slaves. We've been adopted. We wear crowns. We have a new father that is perfect and never leaves. And my last name is God. I belong to him. Lock, stock, and barrel. And everything he teaches me and gives me, I give away. Because otherwise, I'm selfish. And the only thing he asks me to do is love others the way Jesus loved me. That's the one thing you'll find is a rule at our church. And that's it. And she was shocked. You mean to tell me I didn't have to agree to the rules? No, because that's a man's world. God isn't all about that. God is about including you taking you in, and you want it and love it and hunger for it and thirst it so much, you'll do whatever he asks, which is to just love him and live him. And she was so refreshed. Rick. I have a feeling this is the same person who said, every time I come to be with you all, I feel like you're trying to tell me something. Always. And I said to her, no, we're trying to show you something. And that was so clear and profound, it, it surprised me how instinctively she took that fact that we're fulfilling a mission and she's the target. Well, and the person turned around and said to me uh, at breakfast, which she never says the word God because she... She doesn't know yet, or she didn't know, I guess, until yesterday morning at breakfast. She said along those lines, I have come to understand that God is standing there while you all are waving the flags going, hello, over here. I'm calling you to something far greater. That's what she said at the breakfast table. She never says God. And so that was huge to me that she said that. And it's because of every last one of you in this room. You, it's an aura. It is an attitude. It is a strength and a peace all at the same time that just comes out of us invisibly that shows people that there is a different way. You do not have to dress like X, Y, Z to go be with God. So many people think you got to dress like X, Y, Z. If you want to dress like X, Y, Z, fine. But you don't have to here. If you don't have it, come as you are, as that Crowder, David Crowder song says. Just come as you are. And I have to say that whether you guys realize it or not, we touch people. And we are seed droppers. We're like Johnny Appleseeds. 
but we do it for Jesus. And every interaction we have, no matter where it is, we're planting a seed. The smallest to the longest of relationships. We're planting a seed and we're taking what has been talked about in the sermon series and we're putting it to use and we're narrowing that gap. And probably all of us will never get the gap to go away because we're human beings and that's just the way we are. But it's worth narrowing the gap, isn't it? Don't you think? It is. Because I can't... I mean, I've seen people do so much changing and when somebody comes up to them and says, have I met you before? I don't know. And they look at them and go, yeah, you've known me for like two or three years. You just don't recognize me because I'm no longer homeless. I no longer do drugs. I have my family back. And I've been clean and sober since about three months after you saw me. And I am so happy to know you didn't recognize me. Because that's the sign of change that God has done. It's recognizable, but it's not recognizable. People just, what? That's you? No way. And that's speaking to sex, you know, success into people's lives, including your own. Everything you've learned about, it's not just always about, yes, it's supposed to go out into the world and do your community into the world that we're in, that we're here to help with God in us and through us to bring them to Jesus' feet. But it's also about knowing yourself that well and having that relationship with yourself to where you can be honest about who you are and what you feel and be intimate, like Barry was saying, with God and know that you don't have to have the answer he does. That's like a child when they've scraped their knee. All I want to know is that mom or dad is there for them, that they can sit there and be held and cry. They don't need to know where the first aid kit is or that we scrub it out first and then put ointment and then a bandage on it. They know mom and dad have it. And they can just sit there and be a kid and be lost and scared and worried. And so isn't it amazing, the God we have? And like that song said, I'm so glad and that I found that song. You know, we're like a bride waiting for our groom and we're going to be ready for you.